At a critical turning point in the Second World War, 80,000 Marines prepare for a daring assault on a strategic Japanese island. We didn't know how dangerous it was. Never had a clue. It's like walking into a shooting gallery. Confronted by overwhelming resistance, they risk everything to defeat a tyrannical enemy that has sworn to kill them and never surrender. The loss there was just unbelievable. It was hell on earth, that place. Many of the Marines are boys no older than 20. Many will never return from the black sand beaches of Iwo Jima and pay the ultimate price for their victory. December 7th, 1941. The Japanese launched an unprovoked attack on the U.S. naval fleet at Pearl Harbor. President Roosevelt spoke for the nation. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Imperial Japan joined forces with Hitler and Mussolini the previous year to form the brutal Axis powers. The offensive strike on America was a defiant grab for power by the island nation and its military leaders. America was at war. U.S. forces struck back at the Japanese. They liberated a string of islands from the Imperial Army and pushed ever closer to the Japanese homeland. The U.S. set up air bases on these islands. And on November 24, 1944, began a massive bombing campaign against Tokyo. For the Americans, Iwo Jima became an island of strategic importance. Situated halfway between Tokyo and their air bases in Saipan, the U.S. needed it to succeed in their advance on Japan. But to the Japanese, Iwo Jima was sovereign soil, the first defense of their homeland. The eight square miles of volcanic rock was equipped with radar installations to detect the approaching bombers and loaded with fighters to intercept and destroy them. Over a hundred American B-29 crews were lost. The Japanese fighters were also destroying U.S. ships. The island had to be taken. February 18, 1945. In the early morning hours, the U.S. Navy began shelling Iwo Jima from both sea and air. Their objective was to soften the beachhead for the landing of 80,000 Marines that would begin that day. 19-year-old Private First Class Jim Norton was preparing for the invasion. Evil was the most bombed place in the Pacific. And uh, they figured they pretty well, they thought that we'd probably be in there about three to four days to be done. The Americans on the ships had no idea their shells were having little effect on the Japanese defenses. Japanese Navy ensign Kiyoshi Endo. We were ordered to make underground shelters where we took cover. The bombardments continued without a break, but we were able to endure. The Japanese carved over 16 miles of tunnels and fortified gun emplacements under the entire island. Inside Mount Suribachi, the tunnels plunged seven stories into the earth and included a heavily fortified hospital and command center. Japanese Imperial Army Lieutenant General Tadamichi Kurabayashi commanded the island from deep inside Suribachi. Outnumbered and outgunned by the U.S., 
he could not win. His strategy was simple and brutal. Kill as many Marines as possible. He ordered each of his soldiers to take at least 10 American lives. Anything less would mean a dishonorable death. Japanese Master Sergeant Kei Kanai was 21 years old. It was considered an honor to die in battle. We would gladly offer our lives under such a virtuous commander. On Iwo Jima, the Japanese soldiers could not count on any help from their Navy or Air Force. All the Japanese warships and fighter planes were being moved to a neighboring island. They were preparing for the inevitable final stand against the Americans on Okinawa. The Japanese left on Iwo Jima had to hold the island alone. The U.S. battle plan to take the island was to land three divisions of Marines. They would move north to take the airfields, all except for one group. The 5th Division's 28th Marines were ordered to split the Japanese defenses in the south and take the highest point, the dormant volcano, Mount Suribachi. Private First Class John Douglas was 19 years old at the time. And I can still see that in my mind's eye yet, and looking it over and looking over the mountain, and that was, I, I can tell you that I didn't know how successful we'd be going up that mountain. I thought that was probably going to be a bad, bad scene. Nineteen-year-old Private First Class Clay Coble. There was never any uh, talk about uh, if we take it or that sort of thing. We're going to get it, and we're going in there, and the Japanese are going to surrender. Or, uh, boys, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're going to have to kill them. Now, I know killing, a lot of people have a lot of qualms, but if you don't kill them, they'll kill you. An 18-year-old doesn't think too far ahead. I mean, you, you know you're going into action, and, and I, I wasn't really scared. I, I knew one thing that concerned me was I knew when I went over that rope ladder in the morning that I was leaving the mothership, that I, was, I would have nothing of America. You know, I would be just... I would just be on, on a place that I just had no idea of anything that was going to happen to me. That part was scary. On the eve of the invasion, Marines attended church services on their troop transports. I mean, most guys, I think, were pretty much uh, ship shape with, uh, with the Almighty when they were getting going in because they never knew whether they were going to be in eternity or not, you know? The day of the planned assault was Monday, February 19th, 1945. You could have heard a pin drop right on board ship because everybody was, you know, pretty tense. God only knew what was ahead of us, you know, whether they were going to get wounded, killed, or what, what it's going to be like. Nobody talked down the hold when we were waiting to go. They say, Marines, report to your debarkation station. Boom sergeant just said, this is it, let's go. Leg over the rail and started climbing down. You like to be climbing up, but you're climbing down. No, you want to do anything but that, but that's what your orders are, and that's what you've been trained to do. So you do it. As the Higgins boats filled with Marines, they left the ships and began circling, waiting for the signal to hit the beach. Remember, hit the beach Inside the small go. wooden craft, the Marines were easy targets. When you've never had fire coming towards you, you don't even know what it sounds like, but all of a sudden you realize these sounds are different than when, when you're, you're firing, you know? It sounds like a ping, 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 ping. When you're firing yourself, it's quite noisy. And then when you see people falling, you know, you know, they're, they're hit. Get them out of the way. Go and get up. Bring it up. Get in where you can. Get in where you can. Up front. All right. The invasion began at 9 a.m. when the first wave of landing craft were ordered ashore.
For the Japanese waiting on the island, surrender was not an option. I ordered that each man receive two grenades. The first grenade was intended for the enemy. The second grenade was to be used to commit suicide if they were severely wounded or were going to be captured. The soldiers knew they could not be taken by the Americans at any cost. All those who killed themselves before their capture would die with honor. As the first wave of Americans landed, the Japanese forces pounded them with heavy machine gun fire and shelling. They were completely decimated by volleys of fire from Japanese rockets, mortars, and artillery pieces. The damage to the Americans who tried to land was enormous. The men on the beach reported back to the command ship that they were pinned down by the overwhelming Japanese resistance. The 28th Marines H Company could not move in until the beach was cleared. They circled and waited, without any protection from enemy fire and shells. I really realized that, that I, I could very well be killed. We could see planes being shot down, coming down the flame and smoke, you know, and crashing in the water. Guys don't want to say, you know, I'm scared. If one guy says it, then the whole boatload is worried. You, know, you keep it to yourself. Corporal Wesley Plummer was 20 years old. I read the, the 23rd Psalms a couple of times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I've carried it ever since I left Iwo Jima. Three hours after the first wave stormed the beaches, they had finally broken through. H Company was ordered to land. Whether you like it or not, you're going. You gotta go. Corporal Charles Johnson was 21 years old. As soon as the Higgins boats hit the deck and the gizmo went down, I'd look and see all the junk and everything. I said, holy Christmas, this place is something else. This is going to be something. When the ramp drops, you all get out of there as fast as you can. Some go right, some go left, some go straight. The Marines had trained for this day for thousands of hours. When they hit the beach, their training took over. Everybody spreads out because you're taught that. You never, ever keep together. Bad enough to get one guy killed instead of getting four or five killed. The reason that you want to clear the beach is they've already got their artillery and all their mortars zeroed in. They, they've got all the numbers in. All they have to do is just drop in the rounds. And that's you had to get off the beach because that's where they wipe you out. beach, the Marines had to overcome the first of Iwo Jima's formidable natural defenses. It was a tremendous 15 to 18 foot embankment of sand there. We had to get up over that. The island's unique volcanic ash sand was harder to move in than any of the Marines had expected. It was terrible sand. It was very coarse and uh, loose and you just practically went down to your ankles and so it was tough to run. You couldn't get traction from the sand. It was very difficult to uh, walk or run, sort of like uh, coffee grinds. The coarse sand made it impossible to dig in and find any cover. 
John Douglas had the extra burden of clearing the beach with a heavy Browning automatic rifle and clips of ammunition called magazines. The weapon weighed 19 and a half pounds. Each magazine weighed a pound and a half, and I carried 13 magazines. And that's why I couldn't clear the beach. I couldn't go any farther. And when I went down, I could see, I could see the sand where the machine, a machine gun was coming, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't move. Like the Marines before them, the boys of H Company found themselves trapped on the beach. They were facing certain death from the Japanese guns if they could not free themselves from the treacherous black sand. Noon on February 19, 1945. The 28th Marines H Company landed on the treacherous sands of Iwo Jima. It was the first US invasion of Japanese soil and the Japanese defenders were prepared to die rather than surrender one yard to the Americans. Before the first day's end, the boys of H Company and the rest of the 28th Marines mission was to cut across the island nearly 700 yards over open enemy territory. As soon as the men hit the beach, they could only advance a few feet before they were trapped by crushing enemy fire. With the Japanese in front of them and a wall of wreckage behind them, there was no chance for relief. The Japanese destroyed much of the heavy equipment the Marines were depending on to take the island. Corporal Wesley Plummer. When we landed on the beach, it was very crowded. Some of the boats, they had to stop offshore because of the wreckage. There wasn't any place for them to uh, dock or land. Private First Class Bill Nicholas was 19 years old. You could smell the, the cordite, the gunpowder, very readily, and uh, there were sights of... There were, there, were, there were sights that you would see, but uh, you would not want to share them with anybody. People uh, have been literally destroyed, or uh, some were wounded, trying to find some place to get help. The best way I can explain, I look at the beach as I look, it was like hell on earth. That's the best way I can explain it. Terrible looking sight. As thousands of Marines were wounded, their bodies ripped apart by Japanese guns. Medical corpsmen and doctors fought to save lives in the midst of the carnage. U.S. Navy Lieutenant Dr. Thomas Brown all the men that I saw on the beach in our battalion when I landed were dead. It wasn't but a minute or two until I heard the corpsman saying, oh, Jesus, help me. He was attending a wounded Marine whose part of his uh, skull had been blown away. And I said, Roy, I'm not Jesus, but I'll help you. We bandaged his head. There wasn't really much to do, and he'd given him a shot of morphine. The man was dying, and we knew it. And just a few minutes, he expired with his last gasp. The Marines believed the months of intense US bombing before the battle eliminated the enemy defenses. But once the men landed, heavy fire was coming at them from fortified bunkers dug into the side of Mount Suribachi. Every Marine on the island had the thought, I know that at some time I'm going to get hit. I don't know when or how bad, but I'm not going to get off this island without having been hit. We were like sitting ducks. The men of H Company had to advance. They had to get off the beach or they would be slaughtered. In the face of relentless enemy fire, they climbed over the beach embankment and onto an exposed plateau. 
When we got over the rise, the first rise on the beach was when all hell broke loose. And that's when we started uh, having a lot of casualties because of all the uh, firepower and the shelling and so forth that was going on. I mean, it was heavy stuff coming in. I mean, artillery fire and mortars and grenades and rifle fire and everything. I got off the beach and the first thing I thought I saw was a, I thought this is my first seeing of a dead Jap. And I got up there and, and it was only legs. And it was just the bottom and it was, they had the same kind of leggings that I had on, the same kind of shoes that I had on. I knew it was a Marine. It was impossible for the Marines to fight an invisible enemy. I didn't see any Japanese at any time in the uh, getting off the beach. They could see us, but we couldn't see them. And that was a con very confusing part. The Japanese turned the entire island into an underground fortress. Miles of interconnected underground bunkers and caves ran the entire length of Iwo Jima. The tunnels gave the Japanese their only advantage, surprise attacks. Japanese ensign Seiya Oide. Japan had less than 21,000 men on Iwo Jima, and the U.S. had several times more. The Americans possessed superior weapons and greater stockpiles of supplies. But Iwo Jima had to be defended to the end in order to protect the Japanese mainland. Because of the tunnel network, the Japanese could ambush the Marines from any direction. No matter where the Marines moved, they were constantly surrounded by enemy fire. You just kind of zigzagged, and you didn't really know what you were zigzagging from, but you just did. That's the way you're trained, and then you, you go as far as you can and uh, safely, and then keep your line, and then get down. If you've never been shot at by two or more people that's trying to kill you, you've missed an experience. Because when the bullets come close to your head, they make a pop noise, I mean a very loud pop noise. Of course, as long as you hear them, you're okay. It's those that you don't hear that gives you trouble. You're bound to get hit because there's just firepower everywhere. It's like walking into a shooting gallery. The only cover the Marines could find was the massive bombed-out craters. Well, you look for a hole to jump in, and then you, when you think you, you've been in that hole long enough, you take off again and jump in the next one. Whatever you could, some protection, Try you look for protect, protection along the way. When the men found cover, they used it to regroup. I don't know where Nog's at either. Keep a watch over we there, stopped Marie. for a break, Sorry. and the squad leader took out a picture out of his billfold of his girlfriend back home. He kissed that picture, and he said, Honey, if you could just see me now. He put it back in very carefully, very cautiously, in his billfold, and put his billfold back in his pocket. He stepped up over this little rise and he was shot in the chest and fell back. He never did say another word, didn't groan. He was dead before he hit the ground. And I thought, man, they mean business, you know. They, they're gonna kill all of us if they can. Under crushing enemy fire, the men tried to push forward. Private First Class Jim Norton made it off the beach. Norton! Only to receive orders to go back. Go back and get Wilson's gear. 
He was a runner assigned to carry messages between commanders. But his squad was cut off without their radio equipment. The other runner was uh, killed landing on Iwo, so um, my lieutenant said to me, Norton, go back and get Wilson's gear. When Norton got to the beach, he was not prepared for the sight of his dead buddy. Well, I guess you just can't believe it, that it's happened, you know. Uh, but when you see him there, you just realize that he's, he's gone, you know. It's a, it's a shock that you're going to see many times. I couldn't even find the stuff, you know, it was just chaos back there. I mean, guys were hollering at me, you know, get, you know, get the hell out of here. And you just have to go on, you know, leave him there. Somebody's going to take care of him and do something for him. I mean, for his body. So that's a, that's a tough thing to live with. As the sun set on the first day, H Company stopped a few hundred feet short of covering the width of the island. Over 2,000 Marines were killed or wounded. Those that survived suffered extreme exhaustion. None of the Marines predicted the ferocity with which the Japanese fought. After the first day of battle, we uh all I had in our minds, it was not going to be a five-day battle. It was going to be much longer. As the Marines prepared to spend their first night on Iwo Jima, sleep was not an option, no matter how tired they were. Usually you get off a beach area, and then you get into trees or brush or something, and it gives you some cover. We had no cover on Iwo, except to burrow in the sand. Marine patrols probed the Japanese defenses under cover of darkness. They had no idea that with each step they took, the enemy was literally right under their feet. Hidden by their vast network of tunnels, the Japanese could strike anywhere at any time. February 19th, 1945. As Navy ships shelled enemy positions on Iwo Jima, the Japanese responded with a heavy artillery barrage. The U.S. Marines on the island were caught in the crossfire. Private First Class Jim Norton. The noise of those things going over was incredible. It sounded like a freight train. And, uh, of course, then they're exploding all over the place. I think most of us figured this was it. We were going to end up in the eternity the next second, you know, because it was just unbelievable. Holes and craters from the intense shelling provided only fleeting protection. An artillery shell landed right next to PFC Norton. With sniper fire all around him, he didn't dare leave the hole. I expected it to go off any time. Big, long thing like that. It didn't, but um, and it was there for days. In the black of night, Japanese forces had a clear advantage. They had created hidden firing positions called spider holes. Connected to their vast network of tunnels, they used them to ambush the Marines. Outmanned and outgunned, the Japanese had to rely on surprise to gain any advantage on the Americans. But the Marines were trained to be wary of Japanese tricks and avoid shooting at night, even if they thought they saw an enemy soldier. Private First Class Bill Nicholas. We've been told don't open file at somebody at night unless you're real sure because several things. One, you may get the wrong man. Two, you may cons uh, give away your concealment or your position. PFC Nicholas carried a Browning automatic rifle which could fire 450 rounds per minute. It was a powerful weapon which made Nicholas a prime target of Japanese snipers. Shooting that Browning automatic rifle out into the middle of nowhere would do nothing more than draw fire. 
did not exist in the Japanese language. The passwords were either cars or trees. Maple on Lincoln! Maple on Lincoln! Lincoln, because they have a tough time pronouncing L's. And you were to use maple, because they have a real tough time pronouncing those. When the sun finally rose on the second morning, Private First Class Jim Norton discovered he'd survived the night only because of the vigilance of a fellow Marine. Right outside the foxhole, probably within five feet, was um, a dead Japanese, and he had all kinds of stuff on him to blow us up. So somebody had got him before he got us. And uh, it was that way every night, you know. Your nerves play tricks on you. You think you see them, and they're not there, but. A lot of times they are, and you don't see them. That morning, the 28th Marines H Company was to begin the assault on the right side of Mount Suribachi. They waited for the Navy to soften Japanese resistance. Japanese Navy ensign Kiyoshi Endo watched the bombardments. The American battleships were lined up in a row. When one row completed their mission, the next one would come in from the south. The bombardment continued without a break. The Japanese returned fire, unleashing an intense artillery barrage. For the Marines on the ground, the shells were landing dangerously close. Corporal Wesley Plummer. There was a terrific amount of uh, shelling from the ships out at sea and uh, the planes strafing and bombing and dropping napalm bombs just a few hundred yards or, or so in front of us. The U.S. commanders monitored the attack on board ship. At 8.30 a.m., the naval bombardment stopped to allow the Marines to move out. But when the Navy shelling ceased, the Japanese resistance was as heavy as before. The first troops to assault the mountain were devastated by heavy Japanese fire. H Company was called up to relieve them. bandages, blood-soaked bandages, and they had rifles turned upside down with plasma going out and into the guys who were wounded. Let's go. And we thought, if we have to go in there, those guys were. And we're going to get the same treatment. Lots of wounds. As the 28th Marines H Company took up their position, they were pinned down. they could finally see the enemy. The mountain was covered with hundreds of Japanese gun and mortar emplacements. The Japanese gunners exacted a devastating toll on the company. Bob Norman was shot. Our lieutenant was hit. All by the same Japanese position there. Private First Class John Douglas. We were drawing enemy fire from a part of Mount Suribachi that you could see. You could see them firing out, out of that area. We were having trouble. We couldn't, couldn't move, and so the tank came up and tried to give us a little support. The Sherman tanks brought the firepower of 75 millimeter cannons but they also increased the danger for the Marines on the ground. Tanks draw tremendous fire always from the enemy, usually mortar fire. 
and uh, he was writing back was about as close as he can get. And uh, we hollered at him to move because those the mortars from the Japanese were coming right around us. The tank crew's field of vision was limited by the vehicle's tiny windows. The crew couldn't find the Japanese mortar position without opening the hatch and exposing themselves to enemy fire. was going to be wiped out if they could not direct the tank's fire. There's a telephone right there. You grab it and you can communicate with the driver of the tank and the rest of the people in there. It was a suicide mission to get to the tank's telephone. I need a volunteer to go to that tank. Get on the it was a terrible place to go to because all the small arm fire from the Japanese was directed at the tank. And anybody that was talking on it was going to get, probably going to get shot. Charles Johnson didn't hesitate. I really don't know what possessed me to do that. I don't know. I know that we need more firepower up there. If Johnson didn't make it to the tank, the men of H Company would be slaughtered. On the second day of the Battle of Iwo Jima, <laughs> The men of the 28th Marines H Company were pinned down at the base of Mount Suribachi. They were under heavy fire from a Japanese mortar. The Marines called in a Sherman tank to destroy the Japanese position, but the tank crew couldn't see the enemy. I need a volunteer to go to that tank, get on this squad I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. Corporal Charles Johnson risked death by trying to direct the tank crew's fire. So he did what we really were trained to do, and that's to go into the back of the tank. And he told them where the Japanese were. H Company hoped the tank would destroy the enemy position before the enemy zeroed in on Corporal Johnson. Johnson was hit. Johnson's been hit, sir! Johnson's been hit! Come in. Corman! Johnson's in! He sacrificed himself to save the men of H Company. Now medical corpsman Archie Williams risked his life to save Johnson, as their friend, Private First Class Jim Norton, watched helplessly. I wanted to go with him, see how he was, you know, but I knew I couldn't. So. But I knew he was at least okay because he was walking, you know. Because of Johnson's heroic actions, the tank found its target. I didn't do any more than anybody else on that island, believe me. The, I mean, there's guys on that island that did just as much, maybe more than I ever did. But I, I, maybe I was in the right place at the right time. That's it. Corporal Johnson was evacuated to the beach where he found a friend from H Company who had been critically wounded in the same mortar attack. Though the wounded were no longer on the front lines, they still were not safe. Navy Dr. Thomas Brown. There are a lot of men who were waiting to be evacuated from the beach or killed by the enemy fire while they were waiting. Johnson and his friend were evacuated for treatment to a hospital ship just off the coast of Iwo Jima. While on board, Johnson saw firsthand the massive number of casualties suffered on the island. Many of the men didn't make it. The bodies of dead Marines filled the deck. Johnson's friend was among them. They said, all guys that can make it, please come over this, because they buried him at sea. When they put him up on the slab with the flag over, draped over him, and then they said prayers and all. 
and th they lifted up and dumped them right in the ocean. I could hear the splash in the water. It was rough, rough sight, yeah. It just hurt so much that I, I, it, I uh, it's hard to explain. I just, it just hurt me tremendously. If you let your mind think about being buried at sea, it's a very, very cold, cold, serious, serious thing. And they couldn't keep those men all that way to till they finally got them somewhere. But it's just a, it's a, about the worst thing I can think of as being buried at sea. Back on Iwo Jima, the 28th Marines H Company were still locked in a fierce battle at the base of Mount Suribachi. The men had no cover. They were in clear view of the Japanese gun emplacements on the mountain. The company was taking heavy casualties. Second day, our lieutenant was gone. You know, that's your, the guy who's been trained to lead a platoon and knew all the battle plans and everything else, and he's gone. So then yes, a platoon sergeant had to take the platoon. And after that, eventually, it was a corporal doing it. So that's one thing about Americans. I mean, when you're, there's always some guy that can take charge, you know what I mean, even if he's a private, and keep moving. I mean, they don't just say, well, we've got to quit, because, you know, the commander is gone or something. The 28th Marines' advance was long and bloody. On the way up, they had to destroy each Japanese bunker built into the mountain. Every yard the men advanced was hard fought. Private First Class John Douglas. To go across the island, I think, was a thousand yards or something like that at that bottleneck area. And we were three days going across that thousand yards. It was just was just a miserable, slow process. And you'd, you'd be down for more than you'd be up going. The casualties mounted as the 28th Marines tried to advance up the mountain. At the base of Suribachi, H Company was caught in deadly crossfire. I had my BAR and another BAR from another squad was in the same hole I was in. Squad leader said, one of you fellows have got to split because you got too much firepower in one area. So I was with the group that I was supposed to be with, and he was out. This young fellow just got shot 125 caliber right through his throat. He only fluttered his eyes a couple of times, and, and he was dead. I wonder if you're not going to be next because uh, it's getting down to now six or seven guys that are that are not killed and are of our 45 guys, so not killed or wounded, you know. As the 28th Marines moved closer to the summit, the Japanese resistance intensified. Every day was worse. Every day was worse. Only a few days into the battle, the Marines were suffering from exhaustion and sleep deprivation. The relentless days of heavy combat were taking a toll. They rarely got a glimpse of the enemy. When they did, they had only seconds to act. The slightest hesitation would cost them their lives. Enemy! Jam! Jam! I couldn't fire my BR because it was full of volcanic ash. And I had a dickens of a time even keeping that thing clean up till that point. It, it wouldn't fire half the time. The Japanese got down, and we got down, and then the grenade went off. Grenade out! 
February 22nd, 1945. The Battle of Iwo Jima was in its fourth night. The men of the 28th Regiment's H Company were locked in heavy fighting at the base of Mount Suribachi. Corporal Clyde Larkin and Private First Class John Douglas were in a hole facing a Japanese infiltrator. Douglas's weapon jammed as the Japanese soldier pulled the pin on the hand grenade. Larkin got off a shot, but missed. And then Larkin killed him. I said to Larkin, I said, Larkin, I'm hit. And he, he, said a, he said a funny thing. He said, don't die here, Doug. He said, get out of the hole. And, and I knew I had to get out of the hole. I knew I had to get some help. Medical corpsman Arky Williams was in a nearby hole with PFC Jim Norton. Go! I got you, Can you make it? Go, I got you. Help was only 30 feet away. But Douglas's leg was severely wounded. He would have to crawl over the exposed ground. Corbin, get him! Somehow, he made it. Get out of the hole. I need room. I'm here. I need room. Get in the hole! And Arky gave me some morphine, and, and then he just sat there in the hole with me. Just, just stayed there all night with me. He just never left me. He just stayed right, right there. He just was a hero. He's my hero. The amazing thing about a corn is that they, they respond to every cry and everybody that's in need. I don't care how heavy the fire was and how much it was out in the open, if someone hollered Corman, a corpsman came running. When you've got to go out where somebody's been wounded and take care of them, you're putting yourself right into the same spot they were. So it's the chances you're not getting hit are almost unbelievable. But that's what these guys do constantly. They are very courageous. The life of a corpsman is very, very fragile. Stretcher bearers carried Douglas to the aid station at first light. As he was lifted out, his best friend, Charlie Bond, found him. He was an I company, and I was an H company. And he, he told me, don't take care of myself and be, and be well. Anyway, he didn't make it. Charlie Bond was killed in a mortar blast. To have somebody that's your real buddy, you know, it really, I don't know, it just makes, um, it makes war real close. The 28th Marines assault on Suribachi stalled. Pinned down by heavy resistance, they could not advance any further. They continued suffering heavy casualties. Private First Class Bill Nichols. All of the 28th Regiment was around Mount Shirobachi. H Company was somewhat in the middle of a broken line around the base. Once again, the company was being decimated by heavy artillery high in the mountain. Come on! Got it, sir. They brought in more firepower. Okay! No! BFC Nicholas was ordered to help the tank direct its fire. As I picked up the phone, the Japanese began to file mortar shells down around that area. One of them exploded someplace behind me, and some of the fragments hit me in the leg. 
I got one piece, a shrapnel which went through my nose up toward my eye. PFC Nicholas was put aboard a Higgins boat, the same craft the Marines used to land, and was taken off the island. As he was being transferred to the hospital ship, he saw a welcome sight. I lifted up in the stretcher, and everything stopped. I remember kind of leaning over my side and hauling down there, you know, what's going on? And they said, look over that way, you can see it. And I looked over toward Mount Shuribachi, and at that time, the, the flag went up. The men of the 5th Division's 28th Marines Easy Company finally fought their way to the summit of the mountain and raised the flag. And that was, yeah, that was a wonderful sight. But there's a lot of guys that <clears throat> never saw it, you know, never saw that, never, never will see that. Corporal Wesley Plummer watched from the base of the mountain. That made tears come to eyes. It was emotional after all the fellas that we had lost, that we'd lost during the few days it took to take that place. The Marines paid a staggering price to plant that flag on Mount Suribachi. Over 5,600 Marines had been killed or wounded in the first five days. The men who had survived took some comfort in their victory on Mount Suribachi. You know, we thought it was over. They figured it was the end with the flag up there like that. What the Marines didn't know was that while they may have captured Suribachi, the Japanese still occupied miles of tunnels and caves that traversed the inside. Japanese Navy ensign Kiyoshi Endo. The US focused their cannon fire and a bombing on Suribachi. They transformed the shape of the mountain, blowing away a third of it. But unless the U.S. blew off the whole mountain, the Japanese could not be wiped out. H Company was ordered to push north and help take the airfields in the center of the island. As the Marines moved out, they discovered the famous flag was a rallying point for their enemy. It, it intensified the hatred of the Japanese on there. I mean, they really went to war then, after that, seeing our flag up there. Private First Class Clay Coble. You couldn't get up and run. If you did, you would be killed. And, and when, you're, when you're in something like that, you can lay awful flat. You really get to know Mother Earth. As the Japanese resistance intensified, the Marines feared many of them would not survive the long and bloody fight that lay ahead. February 19, 1945. Over 80,000 U.S. Marines stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima Island. It was the first U.S. invasion of Japanese territory, and the Japanese vowed to defend their homeland to the death. It had been more than three years since the Japanese launched an unprovoked sneak attack on the American naval fleet docked at Pearl Harbor. U.S. forces were locked in brutal combat in the Pacific, with a tyrannical enemy bent on world domination that had allied itself with Hitler and Mussolini. After five days of fighting on Iwo Jima, the U.S. flag was raised atop Mount Suribachi. But the Marines on the island feared the fighting was far from over. 
the Japanese continued to attack American forces from a fortified network of tunnels and caves concentrated in Mount Suribachi. Japanese ensign Kiyoshi Endo. Suribachi was conquered, but we still did a lot of damage to the Americans. General Kuribayashi's operation to go underground was effective. The Marines turned north towards the airfields in the center of the island. The fighting was ferocious. In the next three days, over 2,400 Marines were wounded or killed. Private First Class Jim Norton. You, know, you have visions of what combat might be like. We never thought we'd be in anything like this. The loss there was just unbelievable. It was hell on earth, that place. It was just unbelievable. The Marines discovered and captured hundreds of caves connected to tunnels. These caves explained how the enemy could remain invisible, yet continue to put up such deadly resistance. The Americans tried to use prisoners of war to convince the Japanese in the caves to come out. Many ultimately chose death over surrender. U.S. forces used flamethrowers to blast the caves and tunnels with napalm. Japanese Master Sergeant K. Kanai. When we joined the service, we knew we would fight to the last drop of blood for our country. We had been taught that if we became POWs, we would be shot to death. There is no other choice. We went down in their cave, some, and went, went into a couple of them. Just gave you a queasy feeling being in there, to be honest with you, you know, because you never know where they were going to come out or where they were, and um, we didn't stay in there too long. We just looked around to see if we could see any of them in there. I think then what we probably did was seal it off. Machine gunner Clay Coble provided cover for demolition experts as they used explosives to seal off caves, trapping the enemy soldiers who remained inside. I heard one trying to dig out all night long. I didn't get much sleep that night because I was afraid he was going to break through real near to where I was, my foxhole. So I really stayed alert. He was still digging when we went on. I, I don't, I doubt if he ever got out. As the battle moved into its second week, there were rare lulls in the fighting, giving the Marines a chance to rest and write home. All communication from the island was controlled. Letters home were kept short and vague. On a letter I wrote to my mother on February 26th, 1945, I said, Dear Mom, the fighting was fierce, but I came through all right. These have been eight hectic days. <laughs> I told my mother that we was fine and uh, I was on Iwo Jima, and uh, that's all I could write. That's all they'd allow us to write. And that... It was a real short letter. <laughs> After the days of fighting, home seemed a lifetime away, and so did a hot meal. The men were issued rations, which included cigarettes, crackers, and cans of meat. You want any of this? Dr. Thomas Brown discovered a style of cooking unique to Iwo Jima. We were in an area of uh, Iwo, where the land was hot, and it was old volcanic soil. And we used to cook our rations in some of those steam vents that came up through the rocks from way down here someplace. Yeah. 
The accommodations were much better on the hospital ship anchored off the coast. On board, the wounded Marines got a reprieve from the harsh conditions on the island. But for many of the wounded men, their battle was not over. After three days on board, Private First Class Bill Nicholas got his orders. Having found out that this piece of shrapnel did not injure my eye, uh, basically I was announced capable to go back to the island. And so we did it again. We climbed over the side along with some uh, replacements that had been in that Hillkins boat when it came up to the hospital ship. We climbed down and joined them and went back to the beach. Nicholas was sent back into the heat of the battle. His first mission was to locate his unit. It was no easy task. Marines were now spread across the width of the island. I finally walked up to and I recognized one of my buddies and I said, well, it's H Company. And he said, well, you're in it. So I'm back with my group again. 12 days into the battle, what remained of the 28th Marines H Company moved north to help secure the rest of the island. The 3rd and 4th Division had taken the 2nd Airfield, and H Company moved along their left flank. As the Marines closed in on the northern end of the island, fighting intensified. Japanese troops were becoming more and more desperate. When we were up at the northern end of the island, of course our platoon headquarters was at the rear of the line, which meant that when they came from our rear, we were all alone. All of a sudden they come out, I mean, they come out fast. They were coming out running, shouting, waving their flags. Japanese ensign Kiyoshi Endo. When officers made their last assault, they lit the charge with their swords, charging into enemy fire. It was a matter of principle to charge into the enemy when they were going to die. It was over probably in a short time, maybe five or ten minutes. Never saw any other live ones after that at all. Yeah, I saw a lot of dead ones, but never any live ones. The Marines knew the Japanese would fight to the death. They had no regard for their lives, and I believe they felt it was an honor to die for their emperor. And that's not the way we felt, or it's not the way I felt. And they, they used very treacherous tricks when fighting. As long as any of them were living, they, uh, they would fight. Come on out. One day, three came out, and they had their hands up real high. Forward, forward. Had this little short stick with a, a white uh, flag or a rag or something on it that signify we're surrendering. And when they got out in the open and uh, some got up to, you know, accept that surrender, he fell down and he became a human uh, tripod, if you will, and they had a machine gun strapped on his back. Some of the Japanese would jump out with a hand grenade to the chest, and they would explode in, in midair. Even after death, the Japanese were dangerous. They would booby trap their own dead because a lot of guys were looking for souvenirs. If you didn't get your own dead out of there pretty fast, they'd booby trap them. So, I mean, you touched a body, you know, you'd be killed. U.S. military planners thought the Battle of Iwo Jima would last three to four days. But after two weeks of fighting, there was still no end in sight. Really, you feel hopeless when you're on there. You figure you're never going to get off. 
That's the way I felt. I thought we'd never get off of that thing, and uh, we didn't know where we were going to be, how we were going to end up, you know, because they were not giving up, that's for sure. Almost 12,000 Marines had either been killed or wounded. So you just wonder, with all the guys that are gone, you just have to figure somewhere along the line I'm going to get it. You know, you oftentimes you're a little more alone than you think you're going to be. The 28th Marines H Company was trying to advance northward beyond a place called Nishi Village. They were closing in on the new Japanese command center. And the fighting escalated. The Marines couldn't see the enemy, but suspected they were just over the ridge. We were protected by rocks and various other things, but we knew we had to go forward. And we were on the reverse slope of a hill. And one of our guys, I think, could see the enemy there, and he said, did anybody got any grenades? And I threw a couple to him. Hand grenades were the best way to soften the target before the Marines stormed over the ridge. The enemy also had grenades. You know, I didn't think it was a grenade. I don't know. It didn't look like it. I should have realized what it was, but I didn't. But after 14 days, you're not as alert as you were when you first got there. But the next thing I know, I got hit. It had been 14 bloody days since the Marines stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima. The 28th Marines H Company was pushing to the northern end of the island when the Japanese attacked them. The Marines had taken a small ridge, but the Japanese showed no signs of retreating. Marine Private First Class Jim Norton's lower right leg was nearly severed by a hand grenade blast. The Japanese mounted a counterattack and pushed the Marines off the ridge. With no choice but to withdraw, they left the wounded Jim Norton in a crater until they could retake the ridge. PFC Norton was alone in no man's land. He was trapped between the two lines and in excruciating pain. I don't know how to explain it. It's almost like getting hit by a truck, I guess. But also, if you ever put your finger in a live socket, you know, you have that buzzing feeling. Well, that's the way your whole side felt, similar to that. And I do remember passing out. And how long I was out, I don't know. Corman Archie Williams would have to brave enemy fire to help Norton. What's going on over there? Doc, there's a lot of heavy fire. You can't go. No. If Arky waited, Norton would bleed to death. So he made his way toward the Japanese to help his friend. It wasn't just a strange corpsman coming up. I mean, I knew him. I mean, we'd lived with this guy for a year and a half. He was in my tent, so I mean, we were real buddies. And I think he gave me a shot of morphine. I'm not positive. He was going to do other things, and he straightened up a little bit, and he said, ooh, I'm hit. I said to him, want me to give you a shot of morphine? He says, yes. I said, I don't know how. So he told me, and I did. And he says, I'm going back. I said, no, stay here. I said, they know where, where we are. And they'll get us, you know. He says, no, I'm going I'm to go back. Now, his reason for going back, we probably thought that he would bleed to death, that I possibly would. You stay here, you stay low, all right? 
So he did leave, even though I didn't want him to. I didn't want to be alone, I suppose. And as he went back, he saw another wounded Marine, maybe wounded from the same thing that hit me. Arky was shot again. This time, the wound was fatal. He was just an ordinary guy who you knew would do what he had to do. You know, and I guess Americans are like that. We do what we have to do when we have to do it, and that's what they did. But he was a great guy, and uh, he was gone just like that. With Arky dead, PFC Norton was again alone in no man's land, bleeding heavily from his shattered leg. The pain was intense, I remember that, and I kept thinking, if I had a knife, I could cut that off and it wouldn't hurt so bad, which is ridiculous, but you know, you don't know what to think. I couldn't even move, because if I did, the sniper was all peppering that hole all the time right around where I was. So I just had to stay still and pretend I was dead. And I figured if I did, why, you know, I, I would be. I was out there all alone for a long time, probably 12 hours or more. And uh, then the sniper fire was gone, it got dark, and I called for help, I guess. They told me I did, I don't remember doing it. Help! The closest Marines were 50 yards away. At first, they weren't certain whether Norton's cries were a Japanese trick. Then, his close friend Jack Burns recognized his voice. Norton, is that you? I remember Jack Burns calling me and he says, keep talking so I can find you. So I did. Help! Burns and I were friends, so he volunteered to go out. I'll go first. Cover me. To reach Norton, Sergeant Burns and the other Marines had to leave their cover and crawl into no man's land in full sight of Japanese positions. There were no trees left. I mean, there were just stumps or whatever was left of them after being blown around and found. They didn't know where they were going. Well, they took their life in their hands going out there to get me, no question about it. They should have got a medal for going out there because they were ahead of the lines, you know, at night. They always get their wounded and they even bring back their dead if they can. They didn't have even a stretcher, they had a shelter half, which is the piece of a tent that you put together when you two guys put it together for a pup tent. And they managed to get me into that. And all the time that we were going back, they were shooting flares down at us so they could see us. Both the Japanese and our own side was shooting flares. So every time those flares would go off, you have to stop, dump me on the ground, you might say, and get down so they couldn't be seen. I think they put me on a Jeep then and took me down to the um, aid station. Norton's friends had rescued him from the Japanese, but his life was still in danger. Navy doctor Thomas Brown. The aid station was not protected. Some doctors were shot. One was killed that I know of. It's the only one I ever heard of. And a few were injured to the point that they were out of action. Sometimes battle was intense. I remember we took care of 92 casualties in a period of about two hours. 
I'm not going to say what great heroes we were. We were taught in medical school to take care of the sick or injured. Doc, how's he look? Okay, look, I need The Navy doctors could see that Norton's condition was critical. I guess they try to straighten this thing out, my leg. And they asked me if I could feel it. I said no. Yeah, okay. Chaplain, come here. Oh. There you go. Right. Hey, this hey, only anointing. The a priest came over to me, too, and gave me the last rites. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, I was pretty well gone by that time. You know, I'd lost a lot of blood. While Norton was fighting for his life, his fellow Marines continued pushing forward. After two weeks, the Marines had captured Iwo Jima's airfields at great cost. And the reason for taking the island was already becoming clear. The crew of a B-29 bomber called Dynamite was returning from a Tokyo bombing run. Its bomb bay doors were stuck open, creating extra drag that depleted its fuel supply. The reserve fuel tank's valve was also stuck. While Marines were fighting in the northern end of the island, the damaged B-29 made an emergency landing. 30 minutes later, the repaired plane left Iwo Jima. Its crew of 11 was saved. From that point on, American supply planes routinely used the airstrips, even as bitter Japanese resistance continued in the northern tip of the island. With each step towards the enemy command center, the Japanese became more desperate. All the Japanese forces were now concentrated in the last square mile of the island. Corporal Wesley Plummer. We were on the north end of the island, and uh, we were hitting very heavy resistance from the Japanese. And they called for a machine gun. To cover the advancing Marines, machine gunners had to set up in an elevated and exposed position so they could lay down a field of covering fire. I knew how dangerous it was to set the machine gun up, but it was just part of uh, protecting given fire, fire protection to our uh, platoons. One man had already been killed in the area where Plummer needed to set up his machine gun. But he did not hesitate. So I climbed over the rocks and things and set the machine gun up. I could hear the bullets whistling around me. If Plummer's machine gun jammed or he got shot, his fellow Marines would be cut down by the Japanese. After weeks of fighting the Battle of Iwo Jima, Corporal Wesley Plummer took up a position where a machine gun crew had just been killed. The Marines were pinned down by Japanese fire. Corporal Plummer's machine gun fire would provide enough cover to allow the platoon to advance, if he could survive. We'd set a machine gun up where you could get maximum fire or give maximum protection, and you're not thinking about yourself. You, you're thinking about the fellas you're protecting. I fired from that area for a couple of hours. Fortunately, I didn't get wasn't hit. My fire and, and from mortars and other machine guns and so forth, why our company was able to advance and get across this ravine and up the other side. As the battle wore on, some of the Marines took a break to enjoy an unexpected delivery. Private First Class Bill Nicholas. They did have mail call, and 
We thought that's a miracle to be on Iwo Jima and have this go on the way it is. And now to have a mail call. My letter was from uh, Dr. Alan P. Brookhart, the superintendent of schools. Hey, sir. More mail from the mainland? No, Sergeant. That's all we got today. Lo and behold, uh, I read the letter and what it said in it was that I was receiving, <laughs> being awarded uh, membership in the National Honor Society. But the bottom line, you might say, is that it told me that I was going to be granted my high school diploma. Congratulations. That's right, son. I took my helmet off and my baseball cap, which I had. I folded the letter up and put it between my uh, line of my helmet, put the baseball cap back on, and put the helmet back on, and that was that. So I, I had my high school diploma. Maybe someday it might do me some good, but it's uh, in the past as of now. After 23 days of fighting, Nicholas's high school classes seemed far away. The lessons he was now learning were a matter of life or death. Who goes there? You coming in, Lincoln and Maple. He thought he saw three Marines approaching his position. But one of them didn't look quite right. The leggings that you lace down over your trousers to make them tight against your boots, he had them on backwards. Most everybody at the same instant said, he's not a Marine. Three Marines shot him and the man was taken out of action. As they suspected, the man was a Japanese soldier disguised as a Marine. They couldn't let their guard down for a moment against an increasingly desperate enemy. The next morning, Bill Nicholas and his platoon continued their push northward. Toward uh, the middle of the day, we decided to, to move out. about oh, 40 or 50 feet in front of the place where we were. The men were walking into a trap. Japanese soldiers were hiding in a spider hole. It just took a few seconds. Uh, I got hit in the left arm. The two fellows in the middle were killed instantly. My uh, buddy had the uh, thumb of his left hand shot off. The Marines were trained to make sure enemy soldiers were dead before looking after their fallen colleagues. He said, oh, the other two fellas are gone. They're dead. I'll help you out. So he lifted me up and halfway carried me back to where he had been. And I don't remember very much except that I never had any pain, a lot of blood. Bill Nicholas was evacuated from the island. But this time, he would not return to the battle. As the Marines pushed closer to the northern tip of the island, they became bogged down in an area where the fighting was so fierce it was called Bloody Gorge. Japanese Imperial Army General Tadamichi Kurabayashi was in a desperate situation. His forces were running out of ammunition and water. Japanese Master Sergeant K. Kanai. Our physical condition had deteriorated. 
We were suffering from shortage of food and water. We did not have any new bandages, so we tore the uniforms from dead soldiers to wrap our wounds. With fewer than a thousand Japanese forces remaining, Japanese Master Sergeant Kei Kanai carried a message to General Kurabayashi's headquarters. The communique was from Rear Admiral Ichimaru, requesting all the forces to join together at Taiten, on the northern edge of the island. He knew that it would be the last battle. Even though the Japanese troops were starving, they did not consider surrendering. But after weeks of fighting, the Japanese forces could not muster much resistance against the relentless advance of the Americans. The Battle of Iwo Jima neared its end when Marines uncovered what they believed to be General Kurabayashi's last hideout. March 26, 1945. After 36 days of fighting on Iwo Jima, U.S. Marines reached the final command bunker used by Japanese Army General Tadamichi Kurabayashi. Final! If General Kurabayashi and the last remaining Japanese command forces were inside, Corporal Wesley Plummer didn't believe they could have survived. Well, when they blew that up, it was the largest explosion and most noise I'd ever heard. Uh, I don't know how many thousands of pounds of powder that they put in it, but uh, it was it was really really a large noise, loud noise. Some Japanese believe General Kurabayashi may have been killed in a last stand with American forces, or may have committed suicide. His body was never found. For the Japanese, the end of the battle brought conflicting feelings. Japanese ensign Kiyoshi Endo. The young soldiers who were trembling with fright before the battle, ready to face certain death, cried with grief at the news. They were mortified by the defeat. The older soldiers only had an expression of relief. Some soldiers harbored deep resentment towards their leaders, specifically Prime Minister Hideki Tojo, Japanese ensign Seiya Oide. I will never forgive Tojo. He interrupted people in the direst distress, and he remained in Tokyo and lived in luxury. Even now, I will not forgive him. With the battle finally over, the Marines who fought to take the island were replaced with fresh forces. As they marched back to the beach, they passed a graveyard where thousands of their brother Marines were buried. That whole area that we had fought in was, they might have covered in white crosses. All the casualties on the island. During the 36-day battle, over 6,000 Marines died. We had memorial service for the 5th Marine Division. Very emotional. I felt real bad about all the fellows that were killed and all the friends that I'd lost and hope that uh, there wouldn't be any more battles any place like the one we had just come finished up on Iwo Jima. During the battle, the 28th Marines H Company suffered an 82% casualty rate. This one company landed with 240 Marines and six Navy corpsmen. They left the island with only 43 men.
It took some time for those men to grasp the fact that they had survived. Private First Class Clay Coble. Still, we were not real sure that everything was secure or the battle was over until we got aboard ship. As the island was disappearing, we felt more elated because we were off the island. We were not in any more imminent danger. Some of the troops just stood there at the rail and looked back at it, but I think most of us said the heck with it, we're through with that. And it doesn't amount to anything, and I had no desire to look back at it. It was just a lonely island out there in the middle of the ocean. When we got aboard ship, they had pork chops, gravy, mashed potatoes, and homemade roll, yeast rolls. That's the first food we'd had. The American Marines had been through 36 days of fighting. For many of the men, it was the first cooked meal they had eaten in days. Lordy goodness, that was good. That was real, real good food. Although the surviving Marines were on their way home, a remnant of Japanese forces remained on Iwo Jima. Japanese soldiers like Master Sergeant K. Kanai hid out for months, finding food wherever they could. We snuck into enemy encampments to steal food. The Americans' rations were quite good compared to the Japanese military rations. Then one night, Master Sergeant Kanai heard a familiar voice. I heard someone calling my name. He was a seaman in the communication corps. He assured me that he would take me to a completely safe place. Therefore, I should come out of the cave. He asked me to give my handgun and my grenade to him. I handed them over. Since I didn't have the strength to pull myself out, I gave him my hand and he pulled me out of the cave. The Marines were waiting for him. I thought this would be the end of my life. We had been told that if we became POWs, we would be shot to death. Then the Marines helped me, and I was carried to the Marines' post. Japanese Master Sergeant Kei Kanai was one of only about 250 Japanese troops taken prisoner. The remaining forces died in combat. Japanese Ensign Kiyoshi Endo. The Japanese dead totaled over 20,000. On the other hand, the American death toll was over 6,000, and their injured were about 20,000. The number of deaths on the Japanese side was much larger because the Americans rescued and treated their injured. The Japanese soldiers who were injured could have survived if they were rescued, but that was not possible, so they all died. Because of the massive number of American wounded, injured Marines filled military hospitals all over the Pacific. Private First Class Jim Norton was treated in Guam. As soon as he was able, he asked a nurse to help him write home. Why don't we start with Dear Mom? The news was not good. Dear Mom, you have probably received my February 26th letter written in action and know how busy we were. You understand, I'm sure, that I could not write as often as usual, but you know that you'll always are my thoughts. I was very lucky at the time I wrote you. I wrote to you, but the going got tougher and I was wounded two weeks ago today. As I lie here thinking things over, I decided 
you would want to know what really did happen. A Jap mortar hit and my right foot and ankle were broken, causing a compound fracture. Apparently infection set in and the doctors at the rear line aid station found it necessary to amputate my right leg. I'm very anxious to reassure you that I'm not worried about myself one bit and I know how very lucky I am to be alive. And I'm looking forward to the day when I can be home with you for good. Goodbye now. God bless you. All my love, Jim. All the Marines who were physically able began to prepare for an even bloodier battle ahead. We got back on the ship and went back to uh, Hilo, Hawaii, and uh, went back to camp. We were getting ready to invade Japan. We felt that uh, you'd have to be real lucky to, if we landed on Japan to survive, and I, I didn't have an optimistic view of, uh, of that. I felt that uh, I'd used all my luck up on Iwo Jima. I figured it'd go on for years because of what we'd experience at Iwo Jima, no giving up, you know, they wouldn't give up. So we figured they'd fight right down to the last. And to land on the, you know, the Japanese islands or something there, uh, we thought it would go be terrible. We didn't know about an atomic bomb, which is the real reason the war ended when it did. On August 6th, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese industrial city of Hiroshima. And again three days later on Nagasaki. It is terrible to kill so many people with a single bomb. But at that time, Japan was prepared to continue fighting, even if all of the hundred million citizens were killed. Although I feel so sorry for the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I believe that it is due to the sacrifice that people of Japan were saved. On September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese formally surrendered. The war had claimed 300,000 American lives and over a million Japanese. The cost in human life was tremendous. But World War II was finally over. PFC Bill Nicholas. It's just a good feeling to know that hostilities had ended. We achieved our goal. The war's done. But now it's time to go back and be a civilian. The transition would not be an easy one for the men wounded on Iwo Jima. Well, they wanted to uh, take all the amputees from east of the Mississippi to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, which was going to be headquarters for amputees. It was a whistle-stop tour for the veterans and a chance for Americans to finally see the heroes of Iwo Jima. They said that they would stop in Chicago and my mother could come out and visit me on the train. And all the media were there, you know, newspaper photographers, so my mother and myself, our pictures were in the Tribune, the Sun-Times, all kinds. There was about seven papers in Chicago at the time, so they were in all of them. It was great to see her. After all that time, I'd been gone for several couple of years. The Marines received a warm welcome in Chicago, but the journey ahead would be difficult for the gravely injured men. And they were not ready for what happened when they stopped in a town in Pennsylvania.
The men and women who came out to meet the train were not prepared to see the price that was paid for a little island that many of them had never heard of before. I mean, that was a sight that nobody wanted to see, all these young guys getting off with legs gone and arms gone, and it was a shock to them all. So they just turned and went back in the station. They just couldn't take it, you know. I can't blame them for that. Many Americans were overwhelmed by the evidence of what these young Marines suffered on Iwo Jima. But for the fighting men of H Company, the extreme sacrifice was necessary. We were all young, gung-ho Marines, and uh, we wanted to fulfill the uh, the things that we were taught to do. And I think we did a good job of it on Iwo Jima. For his bravery under fire, Wesley Plummer was awarded the Silver Star. For helping destroy an enemy mortar position, Charles Johnson was also awarded the Silver Star. Because he made the ultimate sacrifice to save Jim Norton and one other Marine, Jack Archie Williams was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Freedom doesn't come free. A lot of people think that it does, and uh, but that's not right. We had to fight for it, and uh, we'll probably have to continue to fight for our freedom over the years. This freedom is it's a costly thing. It doesn't come cheap. And I'd do it again. I'd enlist in the Marine Corps again. I'm proud to have been a part of it. And uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take a thing for it. I, I, I need the money, but I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. Because of the tremendous sacrifice they made for the symbol of that freedom, many of the men never looked at the American flag the same way again. I have a tough time at, at hockey games. We go to hockey games real often. And when they play the national anthem or sing the national anthem, it, it's not hard for me to cry. That flag to me really means something. I get pretty upset when I see on TV or read about it in the paper, people destroying or burning an American flag. I've never been present when that has occurred. I just hope I am never present because uh, that would be hard for me to take to see some burning our flag because uh, so many lives have been lost with that freedom. We had a pack before we went in. The boys were men in my squad and that was if we come out of this alive and good, uh, don't feel guilty about those that did not make it. You go about living a life and don't waste it. 